Good evening. I'm Alex Halliday. I am Director of Columbia University's Earth Institute and uh, welcome to our virtual Earth Series event. Uh, each month um, we bring you science and policy experts uh, and they are here to talk about the high stakes, often urgent issues around the Earth and sustainability. Uh, our series creates a window into the work of the world leading experts here at Columbia who are pushing the boundaries of our understanding, um, many of them amazing innovators in social science, in um, architecture, engineering, geosciences, and of course, um, areas like ethics and, and areas we need to be thinking about a lot in the, con in the context of the climate score. Um, so our series actually is very effective from the point of view of actually thinking about some of the most important issues we face. And today we're going to focus on the issue of social justice. Uh, we'll be talking about unjust aspects of climate change and how its consequences are um, like, for example, more damaging extreme weather, wildfires, drought, sea level rise, crop damage, how these tend to be more devastating for those who have the least resources to mitigate the harm. And of course, very often they are the least responsible for causing the problem in the first place. Uh, this issue of um, uh, the ethical issues of, of how unjust this is are, are very important. Um, and of course, it's also a, an issue in terms of intergenerational um, human rights and the uh, legacy we're leaving people in the future. So it's one of our biggest dilemmas and one that Columbia University's Earth Institute is particularly interested in working on uh, going forward particularly in the context of the new climate school that we're building. Um, Columbia is known as the premier organization, or for many it's known as the premier organization in the area of climate. And it's partly because of the amazing work that we have in the Le Mans uh, Earth Observatory, um, but actually it's spread across the university as well in many other subject areas. And today we've got a number of uh, experts uh, from uh, areas of um, social sciences, architecture, uh, and uh, also in particular in the area of um, economics, particularly. So uh, we have three of these people, and they are experts in, in things that have to do with climate change and its impacts on communities, um, both domestically and globally. Uh, the first of these individuals is Belinda Archibald. Um, Belinda is an assistant professor of economics at Barnard College, uh, Columbia University. Her research area focuses on the role of historic institutions and environment in inequality of access to public services and the development of human capital, especially in African nations. Some of Belinda's current research involves the effects of epidemics on gender gaps in human capital investment. Um, the economics of epidemics, the impacts of air pollution on human capital outcomes, with a focus on the ways institutions mitigate or, or exacerbate the impacts of climate change and environment on inequalities, especially around gender and marginalized groups. Uh, Belinda is a faculty affiliate of Columbia's Center for Development Economics and Policy, the Earth Institute, the Institute of African Studies, the Institute for Research in African American Studies, uh, the Colombian Population Research Center and the Center for Environmental Economics and Policy. So I'm surprised she has any time to um, do her regular job. It's a lot of stuff she's, she's covering. Great to have her here. Uh, Marlo Hudson is an associate professor in urban planning at Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation. We call it GSAP. His research focuses on how neighborhood community and metropolitan level factors affect the health and the economic, environmental, political, and social well being of human residents, of urban residents. Uh, Marlow also directs the school's urban community and health equity lab. Marlow's research is very relevant to this conversation. In addition to his academic work, Marlow is co founder of the NEON Group, a national minority and woman owned business uh, with offices in New York City and San Francisco, which works with organizations wishing to increase equity and sustainability for communities. And last but not least is Wolfram Schlenker, 
who is a professor at the School of International and Public Affairs, or CEPA as we call it. He co-directs the Center on Environmental Economics and Policy and co-directs the Energy and Environment Concentration at the School of International and Public Affairs. He is an environmental economist and studies the effect of weather and climate on agricultural production, how climate trends and the US biofuel mandate influences agricultural commodity prices, and how pollution impacts both agricultural yields and human morbidity. Recently he examined how financial markets incorporate climate forecasts and the instance of a carbon tax. So I wanna basically uh, start off with just asking you all a little bit about how you got into your work and, and, and what drives you, what motivates you. So I'm gonna start off with you, Belinda. Can you tell us about your work and, and what drives you? What gets you up in the morning? Thank you very much for the introduction, Alex. And um, you know, my work is kind of originally driven by the fact that I'm, I'm from Nigeria uh, and it's something that, you know, you look around you, Nigeria is a country that's extremely rich in terms of natural resources, but has a, had a lot of issues in terms of, you know, managing those resources uh, and in terms of the kind of development outcomes of people today is not as high as it should be given the kind of wealth of both human and natural resources that we have. And, and so that's where kind of the motivation behind my work comes from trying to understand, you know, you have people that have these, you know, in countries and regions that have very similar endowments in terms of natural resources, in terms of human capital, and, and yet very, very disparate outcomes, right? So, so in terms of the access that they have to public resources that, that we all think you know, we should have, that we all value for economic development. Uh, and so that's where my work on, you know, Alex, you mentioned my work on, on epidemics. You know, I've been doing this work on epidemics for a few years, trying to understand what are the economics of, of epidemics? Uh, what happens to different groups? What happens to gender inequality? Uh, what, what happens to countries when you are hit with this like large scale aggregate health shocks like we're seeing right now? Uh, and then what can we do about it in terms of how can we use our institutions to address these inequalities, to address the negative impacts or to mitigate the negative impacts of these epidemics? So, you know, I've worked on that. I have work on thinking about um, air pollution and, and understanding how air pollution from, from, from oil and gas activities uh, affects human capital development, affects cognitive development in children. Again, thinking about how uh, these kind of institutions and environment affect kind of the most vulnerable populations within countries and, and further exacerbate inequalities. So, so these are like uh, two of my big pockets of work right now uh, within environment. I also have work thinking about prisons, uh, and you know, within our current context, currently, I think this is this has been this has been very very um, relevant and important for me um, in, in the United States to think about the, the criminal justice system and to thinking, thinking about how these kind of institutions of justice can further uh, exacerbate inequalities uh, among ethnicity, among race uh, and, and by gender as well. So, so this, is, this is just broadly the type of work I do and, and, and can kind of inform for, from my background personally um, and my experience professionally as well. well thank you. Marlo, tell us about you and how you get, got interested in your work. Well, well thank you for that question. And it's, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Well, my work really stems from my lived experience. So I come from very humble beginnings. My mother had me as a teenager. We moved around a lot. And by living sort of in different communities, I became interested in why certain communities had better quality housing or transportation or lack of opportunity and certainly the importance of education. And so I became increasingly interested in poverty and inequality and spatial inequality. Uh, oftentimes when we talk, you know, looking at racial residential segregation. And then as I got older, I became more and more interested in community and economic development. And you can't really talk about community development in, in urban communities without thinking about the built environment. How does the quality of housing matter? How where your zip code matters for your health and for your overall well-being, whether you have reliable and affordable transportation, whether it's safe to go out um, during the day, what is, what is it like for uh, more vulnerable populations such as the elderly or young people, are there places that are safe for them to play and to just relax in? And so all these things really shaped my interest in the overall built environment. And really my work now is at the intersection of urban planning and health equity. And so within the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, as you mentioned, Alex, I direct the Urban Community and Health Equity Lab. And that's really focused on looking at the built environment. So many of the things I just described, so you know, the, the infrastructure, the housing, the open space, the natural environment, and how all of these things impact health. I'm also interested in 
uh, the circular economy or sustainability and sort of thinking about how can you build a circular economy around a city, a circular city, if you will. Uh, so those, those are the things that kind of drive me. And then lastly, a big focus of my work is around law and governance. And so within the Urban Community and Health Equity Lab, there's a big focus on land use and laws and regulations and how that impacts uh, people's uh, quality of life. So. Fantastic, great, brilliant. Wolfram, tell us about you. Thanks, Alex, for the introduction, and uh, thanks for having me. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm an, an environmental economist. Uh, I guess I got really interested in environmental economics because economists like to emphasize how well markets work under certain conditions. But one of the biggest conditions why markets might not work is like externalities or public goods, this idea that you create some nuisance that basically uh, other people suffer from. And you can show that then the market breaks down. And so what I do is I'm empirical environmental economist. So I mostly estimate the cost and benefit of various environmental regulation and who would bear those costs. You know, it falls often on very different uh, constituents. And uh, uh, that's sort of what, what drives me. Um, so in my work, I've done uh, my, my initial work was mostly on the potential effects of climate change, especially in agriculture. Uh, with a couple of quarters, we've shown that there's sort of this very important asymmetry. So as you might expect, moderate temperatures are best for agriculture. Uh, and then if you get too cold or too hot, it's bad. But the importance is that being too hot is about 10 times as bad as being too cold. So this asymmetry means that as climate shift change shifts more temperatures into the extreme heat, we could see really a dramatic uh, reduction in agricultural output. We got sort of a preview of that in 2012 where the Midwest had a heat wave. Um, and so again, we use a lot of micro level data to sort of try to figure out this nonlinearity and, and how important it is to then sort of look at those extremes. Um, I've also looked at the effect of pollution on uh, human morbidity. We sort of use network effects so you can show that uh, if New York City or Chicago, Atlanta, the airport shut down because of weather events, that you see an increase in the queue of air, airplanes at uh, Los Angeles airport and all California airports. And so we looked at the same day that something happens in the East Coast, what happens to air pollution around airports. We looked at the wind direction, if you live downwind or upwind in those communities. And if you live downwind, we get much more pollution and using health data from uh, hospitals, we could see that those people actually ended up for respiratory and, and asthma problems in the hospital. So these are sort of two things I work on. I, I'm really interested in quantifying things because I think we really, you know, if you look at the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, they're forced by uh, executive order to basically conduct benefit cost analysis for any policy they want to implement. So it's really important to correctly quantify both the cost and the benefits so we can make sound policy choices and hopefully uh, addressing some of those externalities in public goods we st I started out with. Wow, so that's great. So wonderful to have all three of you here. That's brilliant. Um, I'm sure we could actually talk, I could talk with each one of you for an hour or more. Um, so we're gonna have to somehow get through to tonight in a nimble way. Um, so this is great. So let me just maybe kick off with the current set of circumstances uh, in terms of you know what else could go wrong. Um, so we've got climate change and we've got a pandemic. Um, what actually strikes you most about this set of circumstances in terms of um, what you feel um, what you feel is the most the biggest worries that we should be really seriously shaking up, shaken up about in terms of the current situation? Who wants to kick off with that? I'm happy to start. Well, I you know, there are so many issues that we can discuss when we talk about climate change and where we are now, but I would say uh, I worry about the intensity of the storms that we're starting to see, the overall change in climate, and certainly thinking about urban cities or those along the coast, sea level rise and the, and the impacts of, of people needing to migrate elsewhere. So certainly sea level rise and the intensity of storms, but also tied to that and, and as well with the pandemic is really around governance and thinking about the way governance works or does not work, certainly at the, you know, thinking at all levels, certainly within the United States, all three levels of government, whether it be the national, state, or local. Um, governance matters a great deal. We see that with the pandemic uh, in terms of coordination and collaboration, but also thinking of things like when there are disasters and how you can either uh, prepare people for those disasters and then what happens after the fact. And oftentimes it's the most vulnerable populations uh, 
that are then, uh, you know, suffer the most. They can't leave. They're inadequately uh, prepared. They're, they don't have the right uh, insurance. And so there are all kinds of problems with that. So for me, it's, it's really about the storms that we're starting to see and then also governance. Brilliant. Any thoughts? Hello? I can follow up on what Malu just said, right? So, so, so this thinking about, um, so I, I mentioned in my research, I, I've been doing work on epidemics for a few years. And, and I remember there was a time in the far age of last year when we would present this work on, on epidemics and say, look, epidemics are really costly. They are something we should worry about. The environmental health literature has shown that one of the consequences of climate change in the future is that we will maybe probably get more of these type of epidemic type situations in the future with changing environments as changing environments make certain environments more, more susceptible or more attractive for, for the spread of infectious disease. And, and it used to be that we would say these things and, and, and it was kind of like, well, okay, fine. This is a tail end event that we, we shouldn't worry about. And then 2020 happened and we've seen right now, right? That what one of the things that, that Malo said that the pandemic has done has really worsened inequalities among a number of different dimensions, right? So one of the dimensions that I study is gender. And, and what we've showed in previous work is that these epidemics tend to worsen gender inequality by reducing the investment that parents have in, in female children in the context that I study, but also increasing the amount of unpaid care work that women are doing in the household. We're seeing this in the United States. This means that you know schools close because of the pandemic. There are these lockdowns. Mothers are the ones that are often, are not just mothers, but you know female siblings, women in households because of cultural reasons are the ones that are taking more of this unpaid care work within households. You've seen all the statistics within the United States of women like dropping out of the labor force. Um, and and this, you know, some people think that this might not be temporary. This might be a permanent trend that we see in the next few years, which is worrying again, when you think about gender inequality, when you think of the importance of having women in the labor force, when you think of what the kind of future outcomes for children from now are, are, are going to be. So, so this is something that, you know, we've been worrying about for a while and, and, and thinking about how, how these type of um, climate induced epidemics, if you will, will worsen inequality along, along a number of different dimensions, gender and employment and education, um, and also ethnicity and race in the United States, right? So this is something that we, we, we know uh, in the US context, there is a racial wealth gap, you know, black white wealth gap that is quite persistent, that has been quite wide and, and around for a while, and we're seeing now that you know black americans are much more likely to be infected from covid this is this is as a result again of kind of issues surrounding systemic racial discrimination in the united states and and, and this is really worsening these like racial wealth gaps racial health gaps and you know and, and this is going to be concerning in terms of do we want to you know what what type of society are we going to be seeing in the next few years if if we are we are seeing these kind of widening of inequalities across a number of different dimensions as a result of this kind of climate induced you know, epidemics or, 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 you know, hopefully not pandemics in the future, but, but, you know, according to the environmental health literature, again, this is something that, that we should take very, very seriously and be very, very concerned about. And it's something that we've been working on in our research as well. Mm. Great. Well, from what worries you most? Oh, so I guess I can follow up with Belinda. I think one thing we, we really saw in the pandemic and which has implications for climate change as well is that, you know, we've seen that a lot of essential, what's called essential workers, even though we don't treat them like essential, uh, have, faced the burden uh, you know of the, of the whole impact because they just got a lot more exposure and i think we're going to see similar things in climate change that locations that tend already to be you know poorer or tend to be hotter might see much more of their potential impacts than uh, uh than other neighborhoods so i think that's sort of an analog analog from, from from there if you ask me what worries me i mean i think i have one positive i have one negative uh the positive i mean as we've seen you know with the latest news and the vaccine how like I think scientific knowledge is amazing. I, I really believe in like the research that people are doing in this pandemic case and the two vaccines that were developed in record uh, uh, speed. And I think they're going to be more. I think we also have some amazing innovations going on for climate change, whether it's about battery technology, about other sort of technology breakthroughs that are making me hopeful. Uh, on the more pessimistic side, I mean, we've, we've seen lately that sort of it's unfortunately been the case that sometimes the science becomes politicized, that people just dispute basic facts and it's very hard to have good policies to address issues if you can't even agree on sort of simple facts. So I think we sort of yeah. need to work on the communication and make sure that we sort of can agree on the basic facts. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to have any good policy. Yeah. Indeed. 
Belinda, maybe I could ask you a bit more to drill down into what a bit more about what you're doing. Most of your work has been in Africa, I think, and so uh, which areas of Africa are you mainly focused on? And, and can you tell us a bit about, um, give us some examples of the communities you are studying and the um, damaging pressure points for the vulnerable populations that you're coming across there, mainly? Yes, definitely. So, so uh, you know, I mentioned a lot of my work has been on thinking about the effects of epidemics on a number of economic outcomes. Um, and, and as you said, Alex, in Africa specifically, uh, and specifically, I study meningitis epidemics. So meningitis, just as background, is an infection of the lining of the brain, very nasty disease. Um, you get headaches, you get fevers. In the worst case, you get neurological damage and death. Um, similar to COVID in that it's spread through, you know, coughing and sneezing and, and kind of, you know, nasal and, and throat secretions. Um, caused by bacterium, so different from COVID in that way. But, but you know, a lot of the conversations that we're having now are things that, are, that, that we've studied for a while and people have been studying for a while in the context of meningitis epidemics in Africa. And, and, and the region is Sub-Saharan Africa, so it's about 23 countries from Senegal to Ethiopia that are, you know, 700 million people frequently exposed to, the, to, to these epidemics. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the things that, that we, we have found in, in our research is that you know, first of all, this is the, the kind of bad news is something that we are all realizing now in 2020 with COVID. Uh, as I mentioned, you have significant, um, you know, kind of economic costs from these diseases, right? So, so the meningitis epidemics, they, they are significant, you know, kind of income shocks to households, as we would say in econ. So it's, it's like huge cost to household budgets. Uh, and so, you know, when households are, are, are getting hit with these diseases in, in the belt, they're spending something like 34% of per capita income on treating the disease. Um, you, what you see is this widening of the gender gap in education where parents say, look, I have less, less, less of a budget. I, I know that I would like to get my, my sons and my daughters into school. Um, my daughters lose out essentially because, you know, either because I, I expect them to have um, less future labor market outcomes than my son. So I reduce investment in my, my, my daughters and you see these like steep reductions in educational attainment for girls, right? And, and so, so this is one of the things that we see in our research. We also see that if you look at a number uh, across a number of dimensions, so if everything from you know kind of think of per capita GDP and income and economic activity to you know the the proportion of children that are stunted or underweight, when you have these epidemics, it significantly reduces, it significantly increases, right? The the proportion of children stunted, the proportion of children underweight, and significantly reduces economic activity in this in this region in Sub-Saharan Africa. The, the kind of good news that we found also in, in recent research, this is like going around this, this discussion of stimulus that has been happening in the United States and then around the world, is that money can solve this, right? So an influx of, of health aid seems to, re, to completely reverse these negative effects. So what we found is that when you have organizations like the World Health, of, the World Health Organization, the WHO, say, look, we are now in an epidemic situation. This is an emergency. This is a national emergency for these countries you actually see an influx in health aid from organizations like the World Bank, which seem to work to reverse all of these negative impacts that I just told you about. Uh, and so this is something that we've been like, trying to get, you know, trying to get uh, this point across and get, trying to, to, to get on people's radars to say, look, these epidemics can be very costly. We see this in our research. However, influx of health aid, influx of health spending can reverse the kind of short or, or medium to long run impacts of these epidemics. So, so this is something that, you know, We've been studying in, in, in Africa with meningitis epidemics, but I think we definitely with kind of generalizable lessons for, for the current situation and, and, and you know, future epidemics as the case may be. Yeah. So you also study pollution though, right? Yes. So do you want to tell us a bit about how, I mean, particularly aspects of air pollution that are related to climate change and may get worse, you know, what, um, what has been particularly damaging that you've become aware of? Yeah, so this is much more recent work that we've been doing, and, and, and Wolfram kind of mentioned this a little bit in terms of thinking about how economists think about pollution or, or kind of negative externalities from, from um, economic activities that certain companies do. Uh, in our case, we look at oil and gas. So, so the energy sector is a major contributor to uh, pollution, which is a major con methane emissions from, from oil and gas, so gas flaring, major contribution to, to pollution, um, which is a, a kind of major um, contributor to, to global climate change as well. And, and so one of the things that we've been, you know, we say as economists, this is our using market tools and, and market incentives is to say, well, how do you stop these or how do you reduce the, the kind of level of pollution that is coming from these countries? Well, one way to do this is to put a price on pollution, right? So you can put a tax 
on, on the pollution and to carbon tax that forces the company to kind of internalize the negative external costs of pollution, right? So they're, they're you know, polluting and worsening health outcomes for, in, in the context we look at is in Nigeria, they're worsening health outcomes for, for surrounding communities. You see increased um, rates of respiratory illness, um, you know, kind of reduced uh, human capital, if you will, for, for, for people that are living in these surrounding communities where the pollution is happening. So pollution from these big oil and like big multinational oil and gas companies like you know, Shell, Exxon, that are operating in Nigeria. And, and so one of the things that we've been trying to think about is to say, okay, we know from economic theory, like Wolfram mentioned, you know, one way to get companies to, to reduce this pollution is to, to, to get them to, to, as I said, internalize these external costs, put a price on pollution, but we don't know what the price should be, right? Uh, and so one of the things that we've been looking at is to say, let's look at the impact of this air pollution from these oil and gas activities on you know, health outcomes and, and especially cognitive health outcomes, um, cognitive development outcomes of children um, within the region. Again, with the idea that you know, if, if I get these negative health outcomes that affects all of my future life, my, my kind of future life cycle outcomes, including my earnings, my ability to study well in school, et cetera. Uh, and so once we can get a sense of the size of these costs, then we can say, okay, this is the size of, of the, the kind of total cost burden that we need these companies to internalize. And then that will give us an idea you know, of what exactly the, the, the amount of the tax should be as one, you know, one potential economic um, incentive tool to reduce this pollution coming from oil and gas companies. So this is what, you know, much more work in progress, but this is what that work is kind of focused on doing. And, you know, looking at gas flaring in Nigeria, we're also going to look at gas flaring. It certainly happens in other countries around the world, the U.S., North Dakota, Texas, are the two regions where you see this, like, you know, incidents of gas flaring. Companies produce the oil, they, they have the gas mixed in, so they burn off the, they burn off the gas because they see it as a waste product, essentially. Uh, and, and it, you know, so, so these are the kind of things that we've been studying in Nigeria in terms of air pollution from gas flaring, but also we're, we're definitely going to be studying the U.S. and, and, and other regions around the world. Okay, thank you very much. Marlo, can I turn to you now? I just wanted to ask you about climate change in particular and um, how does it load the dice for, uh, in terms of the way more severe heat and storms contribute to the struggle uh, for poor communities? Yeah, so it's uh, certainly as we look at the increasing in storms or the heat effects, if you look at large cities or cities that are uh, developed with lots of concrete and very little trees, Certainly we know that uh, heat is rising, right? And so the elderly and the most vulnerable populations then need to find ways to get into cooling centers. They, they face a whole bunch of problems around uh, breathing. So asthma rates, uh, air quality, indoor air quality is a challenge. But overall, just many challenges uh, arise when you think about rising storms or storm surges, uh, or in, you know, I should say intensity of storms and storm surges in terms of flooding of streets and our infrastructure. So in many cities, the infrastructure is crumbling. So whether we think about how our older buildings were built with some of the mechanical operational equipment down in the basement and now needing to move them up on top of buildings, uh, the overall flooding that occurs within cities or even in rural areas of sewage going into uh, you know, uh, fresh water, areas are going into front of people's yards, depending on which part of the United States you may live. So there are all kinds of challenges when you think about the intensity of storms and, and the way that our cities are designed and, and, and how they need to be maintained um, and, and rebuilt in many ways. So if we think of cities like Miami or New Orleans or even New York or Boston, or just looking at the Eastern seaboard and the United States, the need to really uh, protect our coastlines from the intensity of storms that we're seeing, the rising sea levels and the eroding of our coast. And what will that mean long-term when you think about the population between say a Boston and a Washington DC, how many people we'd have to move? Uh, what does that mean for our economy? What does that mean for our overall quality, overall quality of life? Right. So in terms of um, you know, damage done to infrastructure, you might think that actually you know, climate change and storms and everything actually are doing people a favor because they're gonna get a chance to rebuild and, and get better living conditions uh, in, in a city housing projects and things like that. Is that, is that actually playing out? Are, are we actually seeing that climate change is actually improving to some extent the infrastructure and living conditions for people or not? 
So, so it, it you know it depends on where you live, but certainly there's a lot of discussions, certainly among urban planners and urban designers and architects, and obviously uh, many policymakers and economists that work in this area of thinking about after these storms hit, A, should we be rebuilding where we just had, where people were living before? And if we are going to rebuild, how do we build better, right? And, and so people are looking at, for example, if you were to look at uh, the New York City uh, public housing, so the New York City Housing Authority and the impact of Superstorm Sandy on some of the buildings and certainly thinking about the Rockaways um, and the kind of damages. So there are opportunities to then say, well, how can we build it back better? How can we build it more climate resilient, more in line with the climate um, of where these buildings and, and cities are located? And the work I do in Chile, uh, I work in, in about three hours south of Santiago. There's a town, informal settlement, Santa Olga, uh, that burned down within 24 hours. Many of the workers were uh, working in the forestry industry. So they created this sort of informal settlement. And you know they were just building on it and adding to it. And eventually the, the fires came through and uh, you know it was a devastating to the whole city. But now they're going through the rebuilding process of saying, let's rebuild it with the proper infrastructure. Let's provide better quality housing and roofs and plumbing and electrical. That is as more in line with the changing climate and will help people uh, you know, live more uh, productive and healthier lives. So it's not just about surviving storms, but how can we also create more healthier communities, healthier cities, given the, the current circumstances that we live in? So presumably, I guess the, the to go back to Chile, I mean, I want to stick with Chile. Are you, you're in that situation, are you actually getting improvements in equity as well? So that that's the plan. So, you know, that's a great question. So one of the things Belinda had talked about was gender inequity. So certainly when you see uh, these major disasters, well, guess who the first uh, ones out in the community are, are women. They're, they're organizing, they're cooking food, they're making sure everyone's taken care of, they're supporting those who have might have lost, lost loved ones. And then they also are involved in a lot of the planning processes, right? They're organizing the community, trying to understand uh, what they should prioritize, thinking about early childhood education, health, and that sort of thing. So in Chile, what we found is that many women have gotten involved in the process early on. And then uh, oftentimes the authorities will come in mostly male dominated, will then try to come in and say, no, this is how it's got, how, this is how, what we're gonna do. And there's been a lot of pushback now. And so they're trying to really incorporate the local uh, community into the process. And I think that that's a better way to think about rebuilding and to thinking about things like schools and health clinics and hospitals and, and uh, you know, first responders and those things. And that's what they did in Chile. And certainly in, in the United States, I know that there are lots of conversations about how do we do better uh, planning, engaging the local populace and understanding what the priorities are. And so if we think of, you know, whether there are storms or even with this pandemic, um, it's hard to tell people to social distance when they're doubled and tripled up because housing is just too, is unaffordable for most people or people rely on the public transportation system to get to work because they are the frontline workers. And so we have to start thinking about these broader issues in society, systemic racism, as Belinda had touched on earlier, as well as uh, the growing inequality. So all of this is, uh, you know, a, a part of the, the conversation is not just about rebuilding, but rebuilding in a way that's much more equitable and healthy and really looking at the systemic problems in our society. And, and frankly, when you think about what's happened with climate change, the global pandemic that we're all experiencing now, it's highlighting uh, the inequities in our society, right? It's highlighting the, the, the racism that has existed in our society. It's highlighting the gender inequities that has existed in our society. And it's an opportunity to really uh, try to address that. And that's why I brought up earlier the importance of governance um, in government, because I think that, you know, it's, it's not always a solution, but certainly being able to coordinate and collaborate and involve more people in the process, especially as we look at demographic change and the spatial changes that we're seeing, uh, whether it be people moving out of New York City into other places because of the global pandemic or because it's just too, uh, or cities are just becoming unaffordable or unlivable for some people. Um, how do we uh, you know, plan for a metropolitan area? How do we plan for a broader geographic region when we think about things that are so essential for all of us? Food security, housing, transportation, um, you know, jobs, uh, all those things are incredibly important. So trying to address that from a risk perspective and the, and the, 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 the impact on black and brown communities and the, the fact that you know, urban, the urban situation in some ways exacerbates that, makes it worse. 
whether it's pandemic or climate change. Uh, do you feel that there is a sort of a risk analysis associated with this in any way? Do people think about this in terms of risk levels, um, in terms of the way it could actually really, um, met, you know, totally or exacerbate problems for society, not just in terms of, you know, GDP or any of that, but actually really destroying society effectively? Yeah, there are people, there are people who look at these and, and, you know, one of the things that's important to, uh, really clarify, it's not just necessarily the urban condition, right? It's the inequalities that we have in our society. In many ways, urban, uh, you know, cities are great places in terms of thinking about your carbon footprint, be able to get around, socialize, building social cohesion, building up community, but it's the kind of systematic racial residential segregation that we've seen in this country and, and, and many other places around the world, uh, where there are other kinds of, of, of oppressed societies uh, that are either marginalized and, and you know, it affects Sort of how the built environment is shaped it affects where the institutions are and so uh getting to your point alex yes there are lots of discussions about what happens in a society or even a metropolitan region when you have great levels of inequality spatial inequality uh inadequate uh, opportunities for people that that really drags down uh the overall uh, obviously the economy but also in terms of just people connecting on a, on a, on a more humanistic level right in the in yeah. investing in their communities investing in government investing in education and so those are all important things and, in, and when you start to really uh look at like the overall economic impact of something like uh, uh COVID-19 and this disproportionate impact on communities of color and the most vulnerable I mean, how do you put a price tag on that, right? It's been astronomical. It's been devastating for many communities. And, and what it really uh, raises the question for people like myself, and obviously uh, uh, I would imagine the vast majority, if not everyone on, on uh, at this meeting today is what do we do about it, right? How do we think about the importance of institutions and the role that they play in our society? So access to health clinics and quality healthcare, access to educational, opportunities and economic opportunities. And getting to the uh, point that Belinda raised, I mean, when you think about so many children being out of school and at home and in these different situations where there is overcrowding at home because people are trying to make it and who does the, where, where does that burden fall? It falls oftentimes on women to do all of those things and still maintain a job. And they're, and you know, and so people are barely making it. And so the question is, how do we rebuild uh, in a way that can, foster a more equitable and healthier society and communities. So I need to move on and <laughs> ask Wolfram some questions, but um, there's a lot there we could unpack with some more stuff, but um, let me get on to Wolfram because sure. we've got to ask some questions, time for questions at the end for, for the audience as well. So uh, Wolfram, tell us about how um, the climate, climate change is hitting the breadbasket regions in particular, and who are the people who are going to suffer first and, and most? Oh, so um, I think one, one issue that's often sort of uh, underappreciated is how big the US is in terms of agricultural production. So in the world, there's like four stable commodities, uh, corn or maize, wheat, rice, and soybeans. And together they account for about 75% of the calories that we consume as humans. I mean, that's both directly eating it and then it being used as feedstock for animals. Yeah. So those four basic commodities, the US market shares about a quarter. So anything that happens in the United States, basically it's huge repercussions across the whole world. And it's one of the big bread baskets is like the Midwest in the United States. And it sort of suffers a, a sort of very common weather shocks that don't average out across the world. And therefore like the, if you look at the overall global production, you can see the signal from the Midwest very strongly just because it's like one very concentrated area that suffers similar weather shocks. And so, when we talk about like global food prices, what happens in the US is really one of the major drivers. Um, we've also seen that policy can aggravate this. So uh, as, as you know, as Melo just sort of talked about, uh, one thing that I think several uh, economists have been very critical of is the ethanol mandate, which mandates that about 9% of the fuel has to be coming from ethanol that we, when we get at the gas station. And that has led to a huge outward shift for the demand for corn. So about a third of the US corn, which produces 40% of the world's corn, is basically going into ethanol these days. And if you think about this on a color basis, it's basically about, you know, the same as the worst weather shock we've had over the last 50 years in terms of reduction in production is basically what the US ethanol mandate diverts from food crops uh, uh, into, into fuel. 
and as a result is sort of driving up food prices. While this doesn't really impact much people in the United States, it can have a really strong effect for people in sort of uh, uh, poorer countries which struggle to basically make their basic needs uh, uh, because their diet has just been going up a lot. So between 2005 and 2008, the commodity prices roughly tripled. So if you live on a dollar a day and it triples, it's a huge impact. If you live in the United States, even though there's inequality within the United States, most people uh, 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 can afford still the diet. And we have some assistance program like you know the uh, SNAP and food stamps. So, but uh, I think oftentimes we have big <laughs> repercussions from food baskets that sort of span the whole world. So that's, um... <laughs> a lot of stuff there on pack as well. So let but let me just I wanted to ask you about uh, Superstorm Sandy and in particular how the uh, how this impacted communities differently as well and the uh, the aftermath of that. Did you have much connection with that? So we had a grad student here uh, Anna Varala Varala. Uh, <coughs> she did a really amazing analysis. So she got like house level data for various neighborhoods in the four states most hit like anywhere from Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York and New Jersey. And she compared like a very close since this individual housing level data on these days, if you research, you can sort of get special access to use, you know, some restricted data. So she was able to merge in the rays of the, of the mortgage holder, for example, to sort of look at differences of impacts. And it was quite striking that the effect of Sandy on housing prices is very different whether you live in a poor neighborhood or in a rich neighborhood. So a rich neighborhood seem to be doing well. We actually see sort of a, and that's sort of something that Melo already alluded to is that we see this reshuffling in a way like uh, we actually see an exodus of, of some of the minorities because sometimes they just can't afford to live there anymore. We see an influx of uh, more white and high income people because these are coastal properties which often are very desirable because you're close to the, the ocean. And so as a result, uh, is this counterintuitive result that actually uh, housing prices seem to have increased even though the storm hit. While in poor neighborhoods, the housing prices just decreased. And the reason there is this resorting that on the one hand, you get a reduction in housing prices because something bad happened. On the other hand, you sort of seem to get more amenities by the, by the neighborhood rebuilding differently, but you're also pricing out certain uh, 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 constituents used to be part of the, of the neighborhood. But yeah, it's definitely spatially very different as Mela said. It's not everybody sort of suffering the same. And what about, I mean, the other basic thing, I guess, is that black and white home ownership um, rates are very different in the United States um, by about 30%. So um, if the home ownership rates are different, does that impact uh, environmental improvements and things like that as well? Oh, yeah, definitely. So, I mean, so we have a lot of research that shows that the exposures of minority and poor neighborhoods to air pollution is much higher than for richers. However, the positive thing is that environmental laws have basically narrowed that gap. So there's a real, you know, it's bad to begin with, but we can do good policy to at least try to narrow that gap. One issue is that whenever you narrow that gap, mean, meaning you make a neighborhood more desirable, is that housing prices start to rise because people basically feel like they would rather live now in this neighborhood, which used to be maybe too polluted. Now, what you alluded to, and this is largely also because of historic reasons and redlining and like uh, African Americans just not having the same access to credit, the home ownership is much lower. It's like in the low 40s, whereas for whites, it's like the high 70s. And so if the home prices start rising, if you're a homeowner, it's a good thing in a way, you know, you have a higher asset. If you actually, uh, 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 if you don't own the home and you're renting, you can start, you know, that you're being priced out of the neighborhood. So we get this, you know, different effects and, and, and since the homeownership rates are so different, they get very differently impacted. You, you know, that, that's sort of a, a real challenge because on the one hand, you want to improve environmental amenities. You want to make it, you know, cleaner and so forth. But sometimes this leads to very unintended consequences that then the housing prices just start appreciating and, and it sort of uh, leads to resorting of neighborhoods. Okay, so we needed two hours for this webinar, I'm sorry. But before we move off from you, Wolfram, I just wanted to ask you one more thing. You've done some amazing work on the relationship between forced migration and climate weather extremes, and in particular, uh, the way that impacts on food security. Uh, to what extent do you think this is an underappreciated risk for disadvantaged communities and actually um, people thinking about risk more broadly from the point of view of security, global security? 
Also, um, I mean, it's a bit of a contentious issue, uh, the, the whole migration and climate. If you ask migrants, a lot of them tell you, you know, I, I left because the governance is bad or because I didn't have enough to eat. So I don't think people say I left because the climate is bad, but uh, what we see more and more evidence is that basically climate change can accelerate a deterioration of both uh, economic opportunities, especially in agriculture, if it gets too hot, it's just very hard to grow things, as well as to, uh, you know, sometimes lead to unraveling of, of, uh, of government institutions. So we have some colleagues here at Le Mans that you mentioned earlier, the, the Le Mans Earth Observatory, like Richard Seeger and others, they've done an analysis that the, the recent uh, basically disintegration in Syria was preceded by three record years of drought, and it seemed to have forced a lot of farmers from the agricultural areas into the city, which then sort of uh, potentially contributed to the, to the uh, unraveling of the, uh, of the government and then to those huge migration streams. But I think sort of, I mean, it's still, it's, it's a bit hard to get this very causally, the story, but we have more and more evidence, several studies that show that conflict is linked to uh, bad weather and, and, and food prices. And we've all seen more and more studies that economic opportunities determines whether people migrate. So it's sort of, if you put them together, it seemed logical that there's sort of a repercussion. And I think the important story is that people sometimes don't appreciate is that we sometimes feel, oh, if you're in a developed country, you're more insulated, but there is a huge like repercussion, uh, even if other countries get hit, because we then see it in sort of uh, migration streams. So uh, a co-author of mine, a student, I have done an analysis where we looked at asylum applications to the European Union and just looking at the same country over time and like all you know, across the world and saying if they were warmer than average or colder than average, did they increase or decrease their asylum applications? And similar to what we had at the beginning, if you're in a cold place, if you're warmer than usual, your yields tend to be better than usual and you seem to have less migration. On the other hand, if you're in a really warm place, if it's warmer than usual, you seem to see get an increase in, in migration. So yeah. it seems to, it seems to uh, uh, fit the a priori sort of expectations pretty well. Okay, so just, we gotta go on to the Q&A with the audience and get their questions. But before we do that, I just want you to give me one sentence each on one particular takeaway you would like to give our audience about this issue. So what would your takeaway message be to the audience if you have one sentence to say to them you'd like them to remember? Who wants to go first? Marlo? I, I, as a community development professor, I'd say get involved in your local community to try to make a difference. No matter what that is, get involved. Fantastic, great. Wolfram? Oh, I, I was, uh, uh, the one sentence. Uh, so I, I think the, the one thing to drive home is, uh, I second what Melo said, but I think one thing we should really always emphasize is this really important nonlinearity we see in all kinds of sectors, whether it's mortality, energy consumption, agricultural yields. And so people who are already warm to begin with are predicted to be much further hit from climate change to people who live in areas that are cold to begin with. And it's sort of a, you know, you start in very different points. And so we need to be mindful of that. Great. Belinda, you get the last word, then we get the questions. Okay, so I, I would just add to, to you know, Malu and Wolfram's point and say, you know, advocate for policies that make it costly to pollute. And also I kind of like the, the kind of Rosian principle of, of making sure that we advocate for policy, policies that, that advantage kind of the, or benefit the least advantaged populations the most. And I think once you focus, focus on that kind of least advantage, the base in, in terms of who is the most vulnerable and everyone else benefits as well. Okay, so we've got a, that's great. Ton of questions coming in. So we're gonna go through these very quickly. If you can give me a quick answer, uh, that'd be great. Then we can get more questions in. So one of the questions is, um, uh, what, can, what ways can we take climate change's effect on mental health and well-being into consideration? Who wants to tackle that? Well, it's a huge issue. I mean, if you look at the fires in California, seeing people have lost their homes, not just one year, but two years, are always needing to evacuate. Uh, people have lost, you know, homes have flooded, their neighborhoods have flooded, flooded have been torn apart. I think these are huge issues and we have to think about the mental health components of people seeing their neighborhoods change, seeing climate change. It really does have a long-term impact on health. So. Okay. Um, are there, and second question, are there any pre-interventions pre that you would put into place? Uh, I mean, for example, communities that are at risk, but 
they haven't had a Hurricane Sandy yet. Um, what do you think we should be doing more strategically in terms of forward thinking with climate change getting much, much worse in the future? What would be your pre-interventions that you would go for? Belinda? I would say strengthening existing institutions. So, so when we talked about, we can use the pandemic as an example, right? When the pandemic happened and we said, look, what's happening is that you know, people have a lot of these kind of preconditions that, that increase their risk of catching COVID because they didn't have access, universal access to healthcare. So that's something that we can invest in now, right? So spending on how, making sure everyone has, you know, equitable, or, you know, free if or, or heavily subsidized access to healthcare is something that we can do. You know, basically trying to sh ensure that all of these existing you know, wealth gaps and, and, and income inequalities that we mentioned that make people much more vulnerable when these, you know, risks or damages from environmental from kind of environmental pollution or climate change happen, make sure that they're less at risk, right? So make sure that we reduce their vulnerability by shoring up the kind of existing infrastructure that they access that, that you know, would then make them not be in, in these kind of vulnerable at risk populations. That's very helpful. So this one's for you, Wolfram. Um, rising sea levels, loss of beaches, et cetera, can, can and will lead to diminished property values and the consequent shrinking of the tax base. Uh, what other issues represent the economic side of the climate issue? So, I mean, I guess the um, one of the things I always worry about with economists is that they they think about GDP and nothing else. And so, tell us what we should be worrying about. Well, we, <clears throat> we think about welfare, right? And it, ideally, we think about welfare, not which is sort of more abstract. We don't want to just think about uh, at GDP. We often use GDP as an indicator, but. Uh, so definitely we have a lot of real estate that's you know at, at risk uh, in coastal areas but uh, i think if you and i guess this is sort of going back to your point maybe then on what we focus on if you look at sort of the risky business analysis and other sort of for the national you know the, the u.s climate assessments i think the largest risk factor is just mortality because we have a lot of uh, you know a lot of response uh, and mortality to extreme heat again is bad. I mean, you can mitigate it some with air conditioning, but if you don't have air conditioning, you're really uh, very heavily impacted and uh, that has a really large effect. So I think that that's actually the largest factor usually in the damage assessments. Uh, not to belittle also what lies ahead with, with, the, with, the, with the housing prices, but people are starting to be forward looking. There is a group uh, out of Wharton, Pennsylvania, a uh, business school, who has a new paper on, on, on Florida and sort of looked at, you know, what fraction of your SIP uh, uh, code lies within uh, six feet of sea level rise and what happens to housing prices. And what you saw at first is that it just saw a huge slowdown in the sales volume. So it's sort of similar what happened to the 2008 bubble that people will realize there's less demand, but what happens is the inventory increases and people are not willing yet to budge and lower the prices. But then eventually after about three years, they saw prices starting to fall. So, I mean, if you buy a house, you should be forward looking. And so I think we already start seeing this, that the market incorporates this. Uh, well, the tax base, you know, I mean, you can redesign the tax base. I, I'm, I'm personally more worried about the loss of life and, and other things than and sort of the tax base. I think we can sort of adjust it in sort of how we, how, how we, how we set our, our tax rates, but it, it's definitely an economic loss, so. Okay, so could we um, just a couple of other quick ones and then we should wrap up, but um, uh, how do we quantify environmental justice areas in terms of health impacts like exposure to air pollution and extreme heat? I guess quantifying environmental justice took me a bit by surprise, but it's an interesting idea. So um, are there ways in which we can actually um, sort of parameterize, put some, some, some numbers around the whole issue of environmental justice and um, from the point of view of health impacts in particular? Is that a good way to do it? Anybody got any ideas around that? So, I mean, yeah, I think there was a big debate and, you know, California has a, a has a carbon regulation, a, a carbon trade system. And there was actually even, it's called Assembly Bill 32, when it was reauthorized, there was a big discussion whether the, the economists like, uh, it's, it's, sorry, I don't want to take too long, economists like carbon trade system because you can trade permits and the person who can basically, or I should say the person, the firm who can abate the cheapest is going to abate, so you're going to save abatement costs. But there's a worry that you might reallocate pollution close to sort of, you know, minority neighborhoods by how you trade those permits. Uh, 
And as there's a new way, innovative analysis uh, that sort of combined the sort of the best, I guess, what interdisciplinary research does. It looks at the wind direction, it looks at the dispersion model, and it then actually examines what happens after AB32 goes into effect to the pollution level that those plants impose or on the neighborhoods. Now, they're not worried about CO2 because CO2 is a global pollutant. They're worried about the co-pollutants that you produce when you burn, basically burn CO2, like carbon monoxide uh, and sulfur dioxide and NOx. And they actually did find that, uh, uh, and this was not apparently clear, that it actually led to an improvement in, in, in minority neighborhoods, that the reshuffling of the pollution actually worked in that. But so we can quantify pollution exposure. And then on top of that, we can sort of also quantify, I guess this goes now back to, to May a little point earlier, that we sometimes also have a different response function. So you, you know how much you get impacted depends on your exposure as well as your vulnerability to that exposure. And so one is pretty easy. We have pretty good satellite data now. We can actually do pretty detailed data on pollution exposures of various neighborhoods. But then there's a much more tricky issue about you know, the sensitivity of those pollution exposure to sicknesses. And that's often determined on health access and, and so forth. And that is much harder to, to measure. So maybe may look at that. Well, let me just quickly, before you uh, jump on that, I just wanted to ask you, we've got to get one last question, I think, which is quite interesting. Um, do you have about the, the solutions and how we're going to do this globally? Um, so given that the impacts of climate change are going to be very different around the world and with respect to different kinds of communities, um, how do you see global cooperation on this really working going forward? Has anybody got to protect vulnerable communities or do you think it, is this something that is just too granular to be dealt with globally? Any thoughts on this? Well, I think if you think about the rise in climate refugees, so people leaving their homelands and needing to trek miles across uh, borders, I think there's a way to start thinking about giving those people some type of, of rights and protections, right, that are global. So if you think about the millions of people that are likely in the future, we know it's happening now, but certainly in the future, millions of more that will have to move around uh, and to go to different places, then I think we're gonna to have to start thinking about uh, citizenship and human rights in a different way that maybe we've thought about in the past. And what does that mean if they don't have their papers, if they don't have documentation, then how do we start to be able to support them and help them? So obviously that's a bigger conversation, but certainly I think it's already happening, this us need to face this reality and what do we do about it? Belinda? Just to add on to that, I mean, this is something that we talk about a lot in environmental economics, even just from this, the, the point of view of pollution, right? So carbon leakage is something that we think about and saying that, you know, and pollution knows no boundaries. And, and we worry that if we don't have coordinated international um, environmental regulation, then what you'll do is shift polluting industries from one jurisdiction to another, which will not solve global climate change. So this is something that I think, you know, a lot of us have been talking about for a while. It was very encouraging when a lot of countries signed the Paris Agreement, and this was something that you know is an kind of important first step. Having countries come together and say we agree to be, you know, at least try to coordinate environmental regulation going forward, so we don't have this type of pollution haven, carbon leakage type problems in the future that would undermine any efforts by individual countries to address pollution. So I think this is something that you know you need global environmental regulation, and I think this is something that hopefully will happen with the with the US, hopefully we'll come back into the Paris Agreement in the next uh, year or so, fingers crossed. Uh, but, but this is something that, that definitely needs to happen uh, in terms of how you solving you know, global market failure, which is climate change. Great, so we need to wrap this up, I'm afraid, because um, we're running out of time. We've got one minute left just to say thank you to everybody. Uh, all of you who've been uh, listening and watching, uh, really appreciate it. I'd like to thank the team for putting this on. But most of all, I'd like to thank Belinda, Marlow, and Wolfram for their engaged and thoughtful contributions. Uh, as I say, we could have gone for twice this time. Maybe we should think about that next time. Um, climate change is an incredibly complicated topic. And you can, today is just an example of the way it, it impacts different facets of way, the way we think about society. And so that's one of the reasons why the Earth Institute and complicated organizations like Columbia, with the academic breadth to really tackle these issues, are so important going forward. Uh, we really uh, appreciate your help. It's been fantastic to get your support in these um, as we take forward our work. So thank you very much for your donations. It's been greatly appreciated. Next month, we're going to have um, the world-renowned author and environmental geographer Ruth DeFries here.
speaking along with Peter Coleman, who's the founding executive director of the Advanced Consortium on Cooperation, Conflict and Complexity at the Earth Institute. They'll both be here to discuss upcoming books and that'll be their, their, they're about to come out with. And this will be on December the 7th. So please join us and look forward to seeing you and look forward to hearing more of your questions and engagement um, with these amazing scholars we have at Columbia University. So thank you very much. Good night and look forward to seeing you again.